Hitman, a technical manual for independent contractors. Originally published by Paladin Press, 1983. Written by Rex Farrell. Audiobook by Alex, a corporate cowboy. Sponsored by Incorporating Associates, a non for profit organization. Chapter 2 Equipment Selection and Purpose A hitman without a gun is like a carpenter without a hammer. Not very effective. What kinds of gun he does use and where does he obtain them? Unless he has a proper false identification, he certainly cannot make his purchase from the local gun shop and fill out the federal registration forms linking the weapon to him. <clears throat> what other basic equipment will the beginner need as essential tools of the trade? What equipment should be added to his inventory later? Basic equipment checklist. Weapons. An AR-7 rifle or any breakdown type. 3-6 powered scope. Disposable rifle silencer. Two extra 15 or 30 shot rifle clips or magazines for you fucking nerds. <laughs> A 22 Ruger Mark I or Mark II pistol or any fixed barrel type. A disposable pistol silencer. A shoulder holster. Extra pistol clip or magazine, again, because these aren't clips. These aren't the variants that take clips, what he's talking about at least. Ammunitions. You want hollow points, bullets, liquid poison, wax. <clears throat> apparently, apparently making poison bullets out here. Okay then, okay. Accessories. You want a double-edged knife with six inch blade like the Gerber Mark II, disposable rubber or surgical gloves, flesh tone preferred, handcuffs, a ski mask or stocking mask, duffel bag with lock. I mean, just a disclaimer as always, I'm, I, you know, I just started this chapter and already it's deep and fucking thick. So the disclaimer is that this book was obviously written and published for informational purposes only. Neither the author nor the publisher nor myself assumes responsibility for the use or misuse of information contained in this book. As to the weapons, the AR-7 rifle is recommended because it is both inexpensive and accurate. The barrel breaks down for storage inside the stick. Now, I think they meant the stock here. Inside of the stock with the clip, again, the magazine. The barrel breaks down for storage inside of the stock with the magazine. It is lightweight and easy to carry or concealed when disassembled. The rifle has a ridge on top, that would be the rail, that will easily accept a scope, even though it is not cut for one. <clears throat> I think he means tapped and drilled. So even if the top of the rifle is not tapped and drilled to accept the scope, most of these AR platform rifles, these AR platform weapons, has a rail on top, which will accept a scope, so long as the scope is compatible with the rail mounting system. The rifle has a ridge on top that will easily accept the scope, even though it is not cut for one. Put the scope in place, tighten it down, then sight it in. After sighting it in, scratch a mark behind each scope clamp to allow remounting of the scope without resighting each time. A three to six powered scope is recommended to ensure accuracy up to 65 yards. When braced, right to 15 shots should cover a four inch pattern area with no difficulty. Get two extra 15 or 30 shot clips from your local gun dealer or order 
through one of the gun magazines, but never load these clips to full capacity. I'm just keeping it fucking true to, to originality, man. It's, this shit says clips, so I'm going to say clips, but we all know they mean magazines. But never load these clips to full capacity, as they tend to jam when fully loaded. Damn, they were dealing with some shit back in the 80s, eh? Nowadays, we got, we got magazines that don't, that don't necessarily jam when fully loaded. You could load those bitches up, make sure, I mean, it's oiled down and maintained, cleaned and maintained, what have you. And they should not jam when fully loaded. That's what they're designed and manufactured to do. When loading the clip before job assignment, be sure to wipe each bullet to remove fingerprints or spray with WD-40 or some other oil. Now it says here, or. It says to wipe each bullet to remove fingerprints or spray with WD-40. I might likely do both. I, I, um, no, not even I, one. One, <laughs> one might recommend that you do both. How about that? <clears throat> Funny. One might recommend that you do both. Why? Because simply spraying something with WD-40 may not remove uh, the residual textures left behind in fingerprints because the oil that, that uh, one expresses, that one uh, gives off from the body might be of a different consistency, a different texture or a pH, what have you, of WD-40 or other oils. And so they might be able to uh, bring that back up even if you just use WD-40. You have to destroy the actual print pattern by wiping it down or it's recommended. One would recommend that. The AR-7 has a serial number stamped on the case. More than likely, they mean the receiver. The AR-7 has a serial number stamp. I'm going to stop talking a lot. Commentary, I suppose I'll leave for uh, every couple paragraphs, maybe. Because I'm doing like every other sentence. I'm really tearing this motherfucker down. And, I mean, they might be writing from experience. Seeing as how it was written and published in 1983. Damn near almost 30, 40 years ago. So they may be writing from experience. But... This author reads as the type who, again, they, they may be blowing this shit up, exaggerating it, or, you know, if they're writing under some pseudonym, it's probably work of fiction, and we'll try to debunk some of this bullshit. Or they might be one of those who are uh, professorial in, in, in their attitude, in that they will <clears throat> introduce or present a material, a subject matter, once and only briefly as if glossing over it and yet somehow expect that their pupils, that their, that their student, that their, yeah, that their pupils or, or their student will have picked, not only have picked it up, but will know exactly fuckingly what they are talking about. And uh, yeah, I've, I've met plenty of those people in the past I, I myself have fallen into that trap, and that comes with uh, months, years of experience in, in, in one specific niche area of work, where as soon as uh, you have to train a newbie, somebody who's never touched the lick of work in their life, <clears throat> you might find yourself explaining to them uh, what the job entails in terms that are... Um, that are you're very familiar with that that one is very familiar with and so when they don't catch on as quickly um <clears throat> you're liable to uh, be short and 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 very curt with them and you know start using uh vernacular that is that is uh very much familiar or tailored to the position which this fucking newbie or this novice might have no clue as to so when, the, when this author says the AR-7 has a serial number stamped on the case, what, on the fucking box that it comes in? No, no, not the fucking box that it comes in. The case, I'm assuming they mean the receiver. And it says here, just, <laughs> just above the clip port. Get the, <laughs> get the fuck. Okay, yeah, no, get the fuck out of here. 
But again, this is the, this is the, the the type of shit that we're dealing with. We could either debunk this author as being just a piece of shit human being as far as technical writing goes. As far as technical writing goes, I mean, maybe they are an ace at fucking killing and assassinating motherfuckers. But no, as far as technical writing goes, they suck dick. <clears throat> The AR-7 has a serial number stamped on the case just above the clip port. Okay. This number should be completely drilled out. And you probably could because if it's a, if it's a steel or, or even an aluminum type, I probably wouldn't go polymer unless it already has some skeletonization going. Uh, but if it's a steel or aluminum, yeah, easy. The whole left will be unsightly, but will not interfere with the working mechanism of the gun or the clip feed. The, the magazine feed, okay. The serial number can remain on the gun until you prepare it for use on the job. After the job assignment is completed, you will be disposing of the gun. Therefore, you do not want any serial number available if, perhaps, some of the discarded gun parts are discovered. Um, yeah, uh, I agree. Um, yeah, I'm going to go every paragraph because I just tore this fucking paragraph as soon as I started. You want to drill it just before the job. You don't want to be carrying around pre-drilled guns, serial numbers missing, going to be looking like a fucking hot boy on some hot boy activities. If the serial number is on the barrel of the gun, on the barrel, mind you, on the barrel of the gun. If the serial number is on the barrel of the gun, Grinding deeply enough to remove it may weaken the barrel to the point that the gun could explode in your face when fired. This is true, depending on where the uh, serial number is. To make these numbers untraceable, use a hammer and chisel or a numbering set purchased from the hardware store to stamp them out or make them illegible. Make sure your blows are, go as deep or as little. Hold on. Make sure your blows go as deep or as a little deeper. I fucked that up. Make sure your blows go as deep as or a little deeper than the existing numbers. Then grind the serial number off slightly. This method will keep the true serial number from being raised in any acid tests if the part is found. Yeah, I'm not going to reread that because uh, that's uh, very relevant to today's day and age. Nah, fuck it, I'll read it again. If the serial number is on the barrel of the gun, grinding deeply enough to remove it may weaken the barrel to the point that the gun could explode in your face when fired. To make these numbers untraceable, use a hammer and chisel or a numbering set purchased from the hardware store to stamp them out and make them illegible. Make sure your blows go as deep as or a little deeper than the existing numbers. Then, grind down the serial number off slightly. This method will keep the true serial number from being raised in any acid tests if the part is found. The recommended handgun is the fixed barrel Ruger Mark I or Mark II. Again, because it is inexpensive and reliable. This gun has a 10-shot clip that seldom jams if kept clean. The gun can be easily broken down in the field, which helps when disposing of it after use. Extra clips are a must for both the rifle and pistol and should be carried as a precautionary measure. Hollow point bullets are recommended because they deform on impact, making them non-traceable. As an added precaution, you can fill the hollows with liquid poison to ensure the success of your operation. <clears throat> I'm not going to attest. One might, uh, one would not absolutely attest and trust their life on hollow point bullets being untraceable simply because they deform on impact. Does it, it de deformation does not make them non traceable? What you want is fragmentation and disintegration. Why? Because putting them back together is a lot simpler 
than using software to iron out some fucking wrinkles. Especially if the base, if the, uh, if the core of the shell is kept intact, the, the lines, the striations, I suppose, created by the inside of the barrel on the base or the core of the bullet are what's going to do the identification. So deformation at the tip because of the impact does not make them non-traceable. Having something that falls apart, breaks apart completely upon entry of any material, if it, if it disintegrates upon entry, effectively dumping all of its kinetic energy upon entry, leaving nothing behind. Uh, yeah, if you leave nothing behind, what the fuck is there to trace, eh? A, yes or no. <clears throat> as an added precaution, you can fill the hollows with, as an added precaution, as an added precaution, you can fill the hollows with liquid poison to ensure the success of your operation. Using a handheld 1 8 inch drill, enlarge the hollow point openings. Fill the hollows with the liquid poison of your choice, then seal with a drop of melted wax to test your guns and i'm just gonna i'm just gonna gloss right over that it's literally less than two sentences of a paragraph <laughs> to test your guns and ammunition set up a sheet of quarter inch plywood at distances of two or seven at two to seven inches yeah to test your guns and ammunition set up a sheet of quarter inch plywood at distances of two to seven yards maximum for your pistol and 20 to 60 yards maximum for your rifle the author is talking about maximum distances here maximum why because even when you're putting in putting in dirt putting in work doing dirt putting in work the ranges are going to be effectively really close you want to be face to face with whoever uh, it is that you are interacting with <laughs> interacting with check for penetration of bullets at each range Quarter inch plywood is only a little stronger than the human skull. Find the maximum range for both your rifle and your pistol. Also, test your weapons under various weather conditions and determine how wind, rain, and snow affect your range and accuracy. Close kills are by far preferred to shots fired over a long distance. You will need to know beyond any doubt that the desired result has been achieved. When using a small caliber weapon like the 22, it is best to shoot from a distance of three to six feet. You will not want to think, hold on, you will not, oh, you will not want to be at point blank range to avoid having the victim's blood spatter you or your clothing. At least three shots should be fired to ensure quick and sure death, at least Three shots should be fired. You can be the judge when death has occurred by observing the wound. When blood ceases to flow, the heart has stopped working. Check for pulse at both the wrist and throat as an added precaution. This motherfucker's talking about watching your prey, watching your victim die, essentially. Watching the fucking life leave their body. Wild. If you must do your shooting from a distance, use a rifle with a good scope and silencer and aim for the head, aim for the head, preferably the eye sockets if you are a sharp shooter. Many people have been shot repeatedly, even in the head, and survived to tell about it. Close kills enable you to determine right away if you have successfully fulfilled your part of the contract. Distance shots may mean waiting around to read the morning papers. In either case, as soon as possible, run a rat tail file or wire cleaning brush down the bore of the gun to change the ballistic markings. Do this even though you intend to discard the crime weapon and make sure you carry away and discard all shells that were ejected as the shots were filed. As, <laughs> I, I, it's because I'm getting fucking pissed. And make sure you carry away and discard all shells that were ejected as the shots were fired. 
discard all shales. Why the fuck do you need a rat tail file or wire cleaning brush for the boar? If, if we just read above that hollow point bullets, fucking hollow point bullets are meant to make the bullets non-traceable. Yeah, yo, this, this author is fucking... Okay, anyways. <clears throat> Continuing. If, for some reason, you just can't bear to part with your weapons, there are five parts that will require immediate alteration. And this alteration can only be made once in the life of the gun. Using a rat tail file, alter the gun barrel, the shell chamber, the loading ramp, the firing pin, and the ejector pin. <clears throat> when using the file, hold on. <laughs> Each one of these items leaves its own definite mark and impression on the shell casing, which, if any shells happen to be left behind, can be matched up to the gun under a microscope in the police laboratory. When using the file, make sure that you scrape the part on each listed item where it makes contact with the shell. Personally, I feel that a weapon used to commit a crime is disposable. This, this is the author saying personally. Me, myself, personally. Um, who am I to commit crimes with weapons? You feel me? <laughs> personally, I feel that any weapon used to commit a crime is disposable. If you consider the value of a gun to be higher than that of your personal freedom, you better leave that gun at home. That's truth. That's fucking solid facts. That factorial statements right there. Factual statements. A subject of primary importance is where to purchase the weapons you use on job assignments. As suggested in chapter one, you can often pick up throwaways from people who advertise in the classified section of the newspaper. Just be sure that any weapon you use on a job cannot be traced back to you by the person you purchase it from. Gun shows offer a wide variety of tools and weapons useful in this line of work. Usually, no registration is required. At most, they may ask to see your driver's license. And with so many dealers present vying for your business, prices may be competitive. Flea markets, private gun collectors, veterans who hoard and stash a variety of interesting toys, and bargain hunter magazines are other possible sources. If you must obtain a weapon through legal channels, like signing a registration, it might be wise to pay some beggar or wino $10 or $20 to present his driver's license and do the signing before you disappear with the gun. Uh, I think the author is right on that. One might, one might conclude the author has, uh, the author's statements there have some merit. <laughs> An important word about revolvers. Although revolvers are often depicted as being a favorite tool among hitmen, they are not recommended by this pro. The author. The author is holding themselves out to be a pro. Recall. Remember? Revolvers cannot be effectively silenced. This is true. The open cylinder allows gases to escape, thus making some noise. When fired, gas is forced through the cylinder in a 360 degree circle, thereby throwing powder all over the person who fired the gun. They're talking about powder like gunshot residue. An automatic, on the other hand, is tightly sealed so that when it is fired, almost all the powder residue is forced into the silencer where it is trapped. This prevents the powder from escaping and covering the person who fired the shot. Some residue will come out from the automatic's ejection port, but only a very small amount. If a shell catcher is used, the powder residue will become trapped inside the catch bag. Remember that a silencer will affect the range and accuracy of your gun. Once the silencer is in place, you will have to recite to maintain accuracy. Those are... Uh, one might conclude those are true statements. Those seem to be uh, true statements. 
basic accessories, a duffel bag, or some other method of inconspicuously transporting your tools to the job site will be needed. Preferably, it will have a small lock. It should be large enough to hold your pistol, disassembled rifle, and several small accessory items. These items should be kept assembled in the bag in a safe hiding place. Wiped clean of fingerprints and ready for use. Ready for use, it says. Inside of the bag should be several, at least four or five pairs of flesh tone, tight fitting surgical gloves. Did you know, this is just the commentary, did you know tight fitting surgical gloves still transpose uh, fingerprints? Whoa, imagine that. Be careful what kind of gloves you use. The author says surgical. I mean, you may reconsider. You could also conduct tests of your own to really know whether or not you go nitrile or latex. If, if these are not available, rubber gloves can be purchased for a reasonable price in the prescription department of most drugstores in boxes of 100. You will wear the gloves when you assemble and disassemble your weapons as well as on the actual job. Because the metal gun parts cause the rubber to wear so quickly, it is good practice to change and dispose of worn gloves several times during each operation. This motherfucker's talking like a surgeon. <laughs> He's in surgery during the operation, during each operation. A small tear in the thin, worn rubber can lead to a hole, leaving behind a partial, identifiable fingerprint at the most inopportune time. This is true. Never dispose of the gloves worn on an assignment in the vicinity of the job. Although your fingerprints may have been covered while you worked, they are clearly and, distinctive and distinctly, although your fingerprints may have been covered while you worked, they are clearly and distinctly obtainable by turning the found gloves inside out. I know a fellow or two who learned this lesson the hard way. Leather gloves are not to be considered as a job tool. It says your leather gloves are not to be considered as a job tool. I, uh, personally, one might think that uh, context may vary. Your mileage may vary whether or not one chooses to use leather gloves. The leather has the same individual distinct characteristics of the human fingerprint. If you have to use leather gloves, destroy them immediately after the job. If found in your possession, they can convict you as quickly as a set of your own fingerprints. Yeah, we're talking about... Um, your bag should contain a few pairs of cheap handcuffs, usually available at pawn shops or army surplus stores. These two are throwaways and may be needed to restrain the mark while you gather information that has been requested by the employer before you pull the trigger. The knife you carry should have a six inch blade with a serrated section for making efficient, quiet kills. Your physical training and combat techniques outlined in chapter one should have taught you where to strike. The knife should have a double edged blade. This double edge combined with the serrated section and six inch length will ensure a deep, ragged tear and the wound may be difficult, if not impossible to close without prompt medical attention. Make the thrust to a vital organ and twist the knife before withdrawing it. If you hit bone, you will have to file the blade to remove the marks left on the metal when it struck the victim's bone. Or I mean, inversely, you just want to change the you want to change the profile on the tip left when you stuck the victim in the bone. You don't want to have the tip match like a fucking like a perfect slot created by the tip of your knife. Um, a rolled up ski mask may be worn inconspicuously as a knit cap until the time to intrude on your victim. Then pull it down and cover your features. A stocking mask may also be used, but may prove to be a bit awkward, but may prove a bit awkward. And the distorted features create, created tend to shock people, whereas the ski mask is not so monstrous. 
Mm, I beg to differ. It says here, a rolled up ski mask can be worn inconspicuously as a knit cap until the time to intrude on your victim. That is true. Then pull it down to cover your features. That is valid. A stocking mask may be used. A stocking mask may also be used, but may prove a bit awkward. Um, valid. Okay. And the distorted features tend to create distorted and the distorted features created tend to shock people, whereas the mask, the ski mask, is not so monstrous. And the distorted features created tend to shock people, whereas the ski mask is not so monstrous. The reason I get caught up on that sentence is because it makes no fucking sense. I mean, obviously you want to shock somebody, I think. I think in the last moments of their life, a little bit of shock uh, might cause the heart to pump a bit faster. And if you're fucking bleeding them out, that's what you want. You want it to be done faster. But then it says here, whereas the ski mask is not so monstrous, like it's not going to shock people. If somebody walks up on you with a ski mask and they're, they're, <laughs> they're sticking you with a knife. Okay, yeah, not, not monstrous at all, right? You will want to complete your bag with a few minor accessories like an inexpensive pen light from the drugstore flashlight department. This will be of extreme value as you pick locks or search darkened rooms. Remember to hold your hand over the beam of light as you direct it. Throw in an ice pick, a large screwdriver, and a flat bladed knife like a putty or a door hook for gaining entry through locked doors, windows, or sliding glass doors. Those are all valid, I believe. You may not need all these items on any one job, but it will be to your advantage to have them in case they are called for. Extras. After the basic equipment has been assembled, the following items can be added to your inventory as they are called for or as you can afford them. If you are seen by some observant witness, it will be to your advantage if the description he gives the authorities is completely inaccurate. Using your imagination, you can totally change your appearance by using wigs, false beards, wash-in hair color, and other disguises. Get books on theatrical makeup from magic shops or, then, or the public library and start to experiment with the many ways professionals completely change their looks. Learn to use wigs, false tattoos, scars, black eyes, and the like to fool your observers. If a man has an unsightly wart on the end of his nose, that is what everyone will remember about him, not the color of his eyes. Okay, okay, I, I get that. It's like misdirection a little bit. It's like sleight of hand on, on the human mind. I can appreciate that. A mark in hiding who expects to become a target may not open his door to you, but he is very likely to respond to a request for help from a woman or an old person who came calling. Along the same lines, props like repairmen, medic, and police officer uniforms may get deadbolts unbolted and guards let down. Yeah, disguise and deception. That's all it's saying here. Misdirection, deception. Some people will argue that a professional will not stoop so low as to play games with disguises. It may be great fun to fool people about who you really are, but it is certainly no game. By using disguises and changing them regularly, a professional has added freedom of movement. If the disguise is easily changeable, that is, if he can get out of it and into another quickly, then he is time and money ahead. A man who calls himself a professional and would walk up barefaced and blow someone away with witnesses lurking about is only fooling himself. If you are going to take such great care in the selection and preparation of your tools, why risk being clearly identifiable? Indeed, the yeast, the Indeed, the use of disguise and props while you carry out your assignments is highly advisable. All of that that was just written is, is valid. It's completely valid. 
uh, just comment. Yeah, I I known some. Nah, okay, not personally, right? <clears throat> let's say let's say one one might um one might be more averse to walking up on someone bareface, like the author says, and blowing them away with witnesses about. Unless they're a, a fucking hot boy, if if what they do is leave no witnesses, if what they do is leave no witnesses, then by all means. But if you're gonna, like if you leave a witness, how much of a fucking professional are you? Unless the intent is, unless it's the instruction is it is to have it done publicly, to to send a message, or or to make a, or to make a scene. Like if you're making a scene to misdirect people, and then you're carrying out your job. If, if the operation entails you to cause a diversion, then hey, yo, a, a disguise might fit the bill, might check that box. If you're, if it's required that you do it personally. Clothing, dress, as well as disguises should be coordinated according to the job setting. A hippie would be totally out of place in an office complex among men in three-piece suits. A clean-shaven, well-dressed young man would be out of his natural element among a group of bikers. A feeble old man with a walking cane and a bag of groceries on the other hand might fit in almost anywhere. Dressed to blend in, dress to blend inconspicuously with your surroundings. You might start with a basic pair of dark overalls, except in certain circumstances camouflage is out. Black, dark brown, or olive green clothes do not stand out and will probably appear at first glance to be a mechanic or delivery driver's uniform. The many large pockets provided will enable you to easily conceal rubber gloves, extra clips, and other tools, extra magazines, and other tools. <laughs> the bulkiness will even allow for concealment of your weapon and underneath you can wear your street clothes for a quick change after the job is completed. Recon of night work, where you do not intend to have your movements detected, call for camouflage or night suits. Be sure to fit this apparel to terrain and weather conditions. You don't, you, you wouldn't wear, you, it says you wouldn't dress in black like a ninja to move about on a moonlit night or on a snowy white background. Neither would you wear light clothes or move about in dark alleys or against dark backgrounds. And if you are the only one running around in camouflage garb, you are more than likely to draw attention to yourself. Just the comments, I believe the term uh, I have coined, I myself have coined as a corporate cowboy, the term is urban camouflage, urban camouflage. If you are like, unless you're actually hunting somebody in the fucking woods where uh, camouflage is, is required to go undetected, to not be detected, urban camouflage is where it's at. If you're going to be in constant contact with people in the real world, it says here in office settings and, and, with uh, amongst bikers the term is urban camouflage and it's always going to be informed by where the job is taking place it's going to be informed by your job sites it's going to be informed by the context and, and by the by the situation by the context which you have to infiltrate you have to infiltrate this context it's like inserting yourself into a conversation the conversation of life you want to inject yourself into the natural flow of things and move like a motherfucking poison. Anyways, anyways. Uninvited entry. Following is a template for lock picks, which will allow you to make a completely adequate set of picks out of ordinary hacksaw blades ground to shape on your workshop grinder. The standard picks. The standard picks, notice that one has slightly less angle to the tip. These two are the most commonly used. And it says here, insert graphics. Fucking picture them. Go look them up online. Use a search engine. 
to look for a torsion bar and a fucking, I don't know what to call the S. I don't know what they're depicting here, but it says standard picks. Notice that one has a slightly less angle to the tip. What they could both be fucking S rakes, and, and I, we wouldn't know the difference. There's no graphics on this. The torsion bar, no shit. Notice. Notice the small sights down at the tip to allow for different sized key slots. A large, thick hairpin makes a good torsion bar. And there's, it says here, insert graphics again. You're supposed to see maybe two different picks and a torsion bar. Lock pick directions. Insert the pick all the way into the lock, facing down. Place the torsion bar in the bottom of the lock, facing down. Exert a slight amount of pressure on the torsion bar in the direction the knob turns to open the door. On the doors, if the knob is on the right, it turns to the right. If it's on the left, it turns to the left. Use only one finger to exert pressure on the torsion bar while you jiggle the pick up and down. No more than an eighth of an inch. No more than an eighth of an inch at most, it says. And work the pick all the way back out of the lock. If you exert too much pressure or try to force the lock, you may freeze it or break the pick. The tumblers inside of the lock must be bounced into place. Each time you remove the pick, you must release the pressure on the torsion bar and begin again. In a short time, you should become an expert at opening common door locks. Padlocks will hardly take any time at all to master. Deadbolts may take a little longer, but they they are well deadbolts may take a little longer, but they are they are well worth <clears throat> the fuck. Deadbolts may take a little longer, but they are well worth the time and effort. They are well worth. But they are well worth. Mm. Okay. Okay. Dead bolts may take a little longer. But they are well worth the time and effort. You can also use ordinary channel lock pliers. To open most dead bolts. By twisting the lock. And breaking the retaining bolts. You can use a knife point to. Hold on. You can use a knife point or pick. By twisting the lock. And breaking the retaining bolts. You can use a knife point or pick to turn the bolt and gain entry. Auto parts stores also carry a handy little gadget called the Slim Jim that will enable you to get into almost any locked automobile in a matter of seconds. These are inexpensive and come with an instruction booklet depicting the methods for entering different makes and models. Imagine that. Surveillance. <laughs> Surveillance. The walkie-talkie or a two-way radio, if it is a really good one, can be an indispensable tool when working with a partner. A good set is inexpensive, but has the range and ability for communicating through walls and over long distances. Up to two miles, at least. At least, it says, up to two miles. Now, this is the 1980s. If, if they're talking walkie-talkies with up to two miles, motherfuckers had to look like bricks. God damn. Okay. A good set is inexpensive but has the range and ability for communicating through walls and over long distances, up to two miles at least. It will also have a volume control as well as a code beeping device. So uh, you could speak to one another in Morse code, perhaps. The vast array of available surveillance equipment and the rapid advances in technology in this field are mind-boggling. The old microphones and reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders that had to be stored nearby are a thing of the past. Now, you can plant a bug less than the size of a quarter and sit in your car two miles away while you listen to the action on your car radio. If you are interested in these James Bond tactics, start collecting catalogs and prices now for future use. So you could. You know, you could price out your uh, your your jobs in advance. It says, apparently, it's 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 alluding to pricing out jobs in advance. One fellow gave a girl who lived with his mark a pretty barrette he found on the floor in a bar. The girl took the barrette home and left it on the dresser. Unfortunately for the mark, who eventually met his demise, the found barrette concealed a microtransmitter. 
the hitman was able to collect enough information on their activities to plan a successful hit. Bugs offers some fascinating alternatives to the old standby method of sit and watch. Check into them as well as the electronic bug detectors, which are now easily accessible. Think of the kinds of information you could assemble with just a micro bug and a voice activated micro cassette recorder. It's the, <laughs> it's still say micro cassette recorder. Again, this is the eighties. So it's, it's, I mean, the voice activated part is, uh, I believe standard, standard state of the art for today's day and age. Micro cassette, definitely back in the day. And think how hard it would be for someone without proper detection equipment to discover it. I mean, if we're talking micro cassettes, those things are pretty large, so you'd have to stash that bitch into the fucking, into like a, a piece of furniture or something. <laughs> Uh, of course, no surveillance equipment would be complete without a good pair of binocs. binoculars. The best have a rating of 10 times 50 or higher, 10 by 50 or higher for night vision, range, and clarity. Even a small micro cassette recorder can come in handy while you are doing your pre-job research and will take the place of pen, paper, and fumbling in the dark. Uh, I would likely not leave my voice on evidence that could be, I mean, unless you're speaking in very general terms, very vague terms when, when you're recording it, otherwise having your voice tied to any incriminating evidence is a big fucking no, no. Don't want to do that. Again, this, uh, this reading is a non-for-profit is a, is a non-for-profit reproduction of Hitman, a technical manual for independent contractors. Originally published by Palette and Press, 1983, written by Rex Farrell. Not me. My name is Alex. I'm just narrating it with commentary. And so, um, doing pre-job research... In, in this case, this, this recording, even, yeah, it's not taking place on a micro cassette. It's a podcast. It's not incriminating because it's for informational purposes only. Informational and educational purposes only. <clears throat> Miscellaneous. An air gun. One with a pump. Not a spring action. With a pump. Will come in handy on a number of occasions. You can use pellets to knock out lights or to create diversions, or you can make your own darts to carry a fast acting poison to the mark or to his noisy watchdog. From time to time, you may need a method for climbing to or from high places. 20 feet of knotted rope measure after knots, measured after knots are tied. So 20 feet of knotted rope can come in handy for climbing to second floor balconies and coming down from a roof. Tie one end in a high branch of a large tree and practice until you can scale it easily. Of course, the tools you use will vary from job to job. Some of you will find yourself using again and again, while other suggested items, some, some of you, hold on, hold on, hold on. Of course, the tools you use will vary from job to job. Some you will find yourself using again and again, while other suggested items will never be called for. Stock your inventory according to personal preference and need. Luxury items. As you move up the ladder of professionalism and become accustomed to success, you may want to increase your inventory with several toys that will make James Bond envious. <laughs> Among these may be cleverly designed attache cases with concealed weapons activated by a button on the handle, fancy cameras, starlight scopes, laser bugging equipment, electronic gadgets, and the like. Of course, your selection of weapons will grow, and you may even have a secret vault in your home to conceal your collection of fully automatic toys like a Mac 11, M16, tranquilizer guns, hand grenades, and sophisticated explosive, ex exploding devices. Sophisticated exploding devices. You will be able to afford the best 
in false identifications and obtain real uniforms, real uniforms and badges for various state and federal law enforcement agencies to aid in the performance of your contracts. Throwaway cars and boats may even become common and you may even own your very own plane through legal methods explained later. Money talks and in, and for every need you have, there is a man out there who is willing to fill it for you at a price. For you for a price. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Money talks. I see I said at a price because it's because it sounds it reads better. Money talks, and for every need you have, there is a man out there who is willing to fill it for you for a price. That's how you got started, remember? But money buys a lot more than material things. Money can buy smart attorneys, judges, alibis, and even time, if necessary. They say money, they say money can't buy happiness, but it can buy you time. How about that? The possibilities are endless for the smart man who plans his moves accordingly, is mentally and physically prepared, and doesn't leave any trails as he performs his highly paid services. That's the end of chapter two. Visit us online, Corporate Cowboys, Is the Instagram page. If you would like to donate directly to keep this operation not for profit, you can do so by way of Venmo, PayPal, Cash App. It's in a link somewhere. You're a smart ducky. You can find it. Until the next part. Have a nice one.